Okay, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Let's get started. Um, as promised, a few notes about the final project. As you all know by now, you've got basically two processes that are running in parallel, the process that's uh, evolving your robots, and then the other process that is simulating one robot after the other, or possibly one swarm after the other. These two processes are communicating between each other <clears throat> with one writing to a file, the other reading from that file, and when it's done reading with that file, it deletes it, and around and around you go. Simple way to get two separate processes to communicate uh, on your computer, but a very hacky way to do it. There are much, much more elegant ways to get multiple processes to communicate with one another. We didn't cover that uh, in this course, so we're using this relatively simpler way of using files as intermediaries between the two processes, which is simple, works most of the time, until you start evolving large numbers of robots and you're writing and reading hundreds and possibly thousands of files as your evolutionary algorithm is running. So a couple of you have reported seeing things like file permission errors. Anybody had that issue? Again, this is sort of this uh, um, a result of the fact that we're using the simpler way to communicate between processes. So my advice to you is if you're comfortable with, uh, if you're comfortable with inter-process communication, you can do away with the files and set up sockets to communicate between your processes. It's not a trivial thing to do if you haven't done it before. Um, so I would suggest for those of you that aren't comfortable with working with sockets and inter-process communication, stick with the files and check a couple things. Make sure that when you're writing a file to disk that another process is gonna try and read. You're writing it to something that has a unique and temporary name so that that other file doesn't know where it is. And then once that file has been written, then you issue a, a system command to rename that temporary file to a name that the other process does recognize. You, know? you can imagine the first process running, process running out to a file. It's part way, it's almost finished completing it. It's just finishing that file. The ink is just drying on that file. It's set in the process of setting the permissions and this one comes in and tries to read it. Things can go wrong. Uh, depending on whether you're on a Mac or PC under those conditions. Yeah? So it's not ideal. Second hack, which is also not uh, very elegant, is just to wait a little bit before you write files. So uh, you can have a look at uh, how often you're writing files to disk, and if it's very frequent, slow it down, which of course is gonna slow down your evolutionary algorithm as well, but it'll minimize the chance of these sort of uh, file permission collisions. Yeah? Again, not a perfect solution, but question? Yeah, I was going to say, I actually had a lot of the file writing errors, and when you put in the sleep step, like, to wait if it's not written, okay. it's made that a little bit longer, and a lot of the errors I had went away. Great, thank you for that, exactly. So the, the one that's waiting for some information in a file, if you sleep that process yeah. for a little bit, it, it can alleviate like that, that issue. Loop, and it was like Great. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, how I solved that problem is I used a try block, and every time it failed to read or write something, I then had it wait a second and try again. Oh, great. So you're even not better. every single time. So Perfect. That that so much. that's even more elegant. Can you email me the try block solution, and then I will send it back out to everyone sure. to give that a try for those that are having that issue? Yeah. Anything else? Any other issues? So far, so good? Okay, all right. So, uh, as you all know, the end of the semester approaches. We have one, two, three more weeks of lecture together, and then uh, our exam period. You will all be presenting the results from your final uh, presentations in about two minutes and 30 seconds. We have, you, we have 60 of them to get through. As we get closer to the final exam period, we'll talk about how exactly all of that is going to run. Um, as you can see from the schedule, we've got two more themes uh, to touch on in this course before we're done. We started in last time on looking at uh, collective behavior. 
for very good reasons. Animals often team up because there's a lot of tasks in nature that are better to do as a group than an individual organism. Same thing for machines. As we're gonna see in a few minutes, we're gonna look at an experiment in which they evolved behaviors not for a single robot, but for a swarm of robots, and wanted to see, first of all, could they get, uh, could they get useful behavior for a swarm? And if useful swarm behavior evolves, what form does it take? How does that swarm coordinate and cooperate? Next time, we'll look at a, a separate project that looks also at swarms of robots that communicate with one another to coordinate their collective action. And then next week, we'll start in on the final theme of the course. This has been a long time coming. The unique advantage of evolutionary approaches other, over other kinds of machine learning is it's material agnostic. An evolutionary algorithm doesn't care whether it's optimizing weights for synapses in a neural network or the length of the leg of a robot, or as we'll see in the last two lectures, how to rearrange biological cells to make biological robots. Yeah. Okay, all right, so that's where we're headed. Back to where we are, uh, swarm robotics. Uh, again, some beautiful examples in nature of animals coordinating on a large uh, scale. And we ended last time with the Boyd's algorithm invented by a computer graphics researcher way back in the 1980s. You can code up the Boyd's algorithm. It's not that complicated. Uh, you create three separate functions and every agent in the swarm computes those three functions at every time step. Each of these three functions spits out a delta heading, a way in which the agent, in this case the green agent, should change its heading based on what its neighbors are doing. And as you can see in this uh, admittedly low resolution graphic from last time, you get some pretty sophisticated swarm behavior. This was the chat GPT moment in the 1980s. Okay, you can probably understand from the Boyd's algorithm why the, why the Boyd's flock, why do they flow around the cylinder? It's something you sort of get for free from the Boyd's algorithm. Why don't the Boyd's crash into the cylinder? Exactly, yep. So remember, there are these three sub-functions, and they sort of uh, balance each other out. As you mentioned, the separation algorithm will cause it to move away from other team members that are too close to it in its sensing radius, and other stuff. If there's anything else that's too close, it will change its heading to move away from them. Why does, in the video, the flock split into two around the cylinder, and why does the flock re-cohere on the far side and continue on as if nothing happened? Cohesion, right? Lots of nice things about the Boyd's algorithm. First thing is that it's simple. The second thing is that it tends to give you other kinds of behavior you see in collectives of animals for free. Okay. As I also mentioned last time, this became the cornerstone uh, of uh, CGI, or what came to be known as CGI in Hollywood. Here you can see The Lion King from uh, 1994. Here's a herd of wildebeest. You'll notice that they flow around some of the spurs uh, of rock here. Modern CGI, modern CGI, most of them are running some version of the Boyd's algorithm, but instead of three uh, subroutines, there are hundreds or thousands that tailor the individual behavior of the members of the swarm. Okay. I chose uh, the Lion King uh, on purpose because we're now going to switch back to evolutionary robotics, but we're going to stay on the Serengeti. Yeah? Actually, before we get to evolutionary robotics, back to nature for a moment. If you were a lion out on the Serengeti, a hungry lion, and there is a Thompson gazelle nearby that you want to bring down for lunch, how much time do you have to bring down the gazelle for lunch? 
You've got four seconds, yeah? If you've got a house cat at home, there's a reason why they slink and, and sneak up on things, because if you're a small or a large cat, you wanna get as close to your prey as possible, because you can accelerate faster, you, the cats, can accelerate faster than most non-cat prey, but the top speed for most cats is below the top speed of their prey, yeah? So if you're a single lion, you can try and get as close to your prey as possible. But on the Serengeti, that's often pretty difficult because there aren't many obstacles and it's very difficult to get quite close to your prey. So if you're an enterprising lion, what's another option for you? Team up, right? Okay, so in retrospect, uh, evolving teams of predatory robots, maybe not politically correct these days. We're gonna just use collective hunting as an experimental setup to test whether and how we can evolve behaviors of groups of robots to work together. So in this uh, experiment that we're gonna look at today, it goes back quite a ways. Uh, the two investigators asked the following three questions. First of all, can we evolve behaviors for a team of predators to work together? Uh, how can we go about evolving them to do so? What, way, what design decisions do we make about the evolutionary algorithm, the fitness function, mutation, selection, crossover, to facilitate the evolutionary algorithm's ability to evolve collective behavior? And if we do manage to evolve collective behavior, do they evolve to co cooperate? And there's a fourth question, if they cooperate, how did they evolve to cooperate? Yeah? Okay, so let's put on our pith helmets and head out on the virtual Serengeti plane. Uh, you'll note from the date that again, this is before physics engines existed. So again, we're looking at a very, very simple uh, simulation. No physics here. We have a perfectly flat two-dimensional uh, plane and we're gonna place into this 2D plane five, not really robots, agents. We're gonna call these things agents because they don't actually have physical bodies. There's no legs, they don't have mass. They're sort of disembodied points in this two-dimensional space, but they can sense and they can act. <clears throat> We're gonna place one virtual gazelle into this virtual Serengeti plane. We are not gonna evolve the behavior of the gazelle. We are gonna pre-program the behavior of the gazelle and the behavior is always gonna be the same. The gazelle is always gonna move three distance units at every turn or every time step of the simulation. You'll see that the plane itself is 15 by 15 units uh, wide and deep. We're gonna place four virtual lions and we are gonna evolve the behavior for these lions. They, however, can only travel one unit uh, per turn. So we're really making things hard on the lions here. Their, uh, their top speed is one third that of the gazelle. Okay. This savanna, virtual savanna here is actually uh, is toroidal. So if you think of this two-dimensional sheet uh, as a piece of paper, we can take that sheet and bend it into a cylinder so that the two long ends come into contact with one another. So for example, if at a given point in time t, the gazelle is here and the gazelle moves uh, northwest, at the next time step, it's gonna end up at this point on this two-dimensional plane, yeah? It's walked across the long seam of the cylinder, yeah? We're gonna take that cylinder and bend it into a donut so that the two end circles of the cylinder also connect. And by doing that, we create a donut or a toroid, which means, in effect, we have an infinite plane, yeah? A gazelle or a lion can keep moving in a straight line relative to the surface of this toroid and they will never hit a wall or fall off the edge of the world. Yeah, everybody see that? So this also makes things difficult on the lions. Why? Order, like the animal. 
they can't corner their prey. Yeah? Okay, so we're, we're stacking the deck against uh, the lions here. Okay. So as I mentioned, we're going to pre-program the behavior of the gazelle. Uh, and to do so, we're going to start working with vector operations because at every point in time, we want back five vectors, one for the gazelle and four uh, for the lions, where the vector is a 2D vector indicating where they want to move at the next time step. Yeah? So how do we compute the behavior of the gazelle? We're going to sum over a set of vectors, uppercase V, which is going to represent four vectors. This set is going to contain four vectors, <coughs> which are the vectors that connect the gazelle to the lion. Each of these vectors is going to be the shortest distance between the gazelle and that lion. Sorry, I forgot to mention here. Uh, this ability to sense the other lions from the point of view of the gazelle takes into an account the toroid. So if we look at this point, if we look at the gazelle's position at time t plus one, and the gazelle wants to sense how it, where its position is relative to the fourth lion, it looks like the gazelle is quite far from the lion, but remember that the gazelle and L4 are embedded in this toroid, so the gazelle is actually quite close to the lion, yeah? What is the furthest distance between any two uh, members of these five agents? What's the furthest the gazelle can be from a lion? What's the furthest the gazelle can be from a lion in this toroidal space? Absolutely, right? So we have a 15 by 15 sheet that we've turned into a toroid. So as you say, if we placed, for example, the lion at one of the corners and the gazelle at the center, that's the furthest it can be from, uh, from each other, represented here by uh, the Euclidean distance of max here. So there's a max distance. Yeah. So this cartoon is a little misleading. The uh, arrow, for example, that connects the gazelle to L4 here. This is actually probably not the shortest distance between the gazelle and the lion. It's probably that vector. Everybody see that? Okay. So we're going to sum up these vectors, and then we're going to take the negative of that sum. Why? What's the negative for? You want it to go away from the... Go away from the average the center of mass of the lions, right? Or your, your distance from the lions. Why are we dividing by the Euclidean distance of the vector that connects the gazelle to the lion? It's actually a weighted sum here. What is this weight doing to the behavior of the gazelle? Absolutely, right? Smart thing for the gazelle to do. If the distance, uh, if the Euclidean distance V here is small, that means that particular lion is close to the gazelle and it's going to have a, more of an influence on the direction that the gazelle heads at the next time step. Yeah? Uh, there, this is a normalized, normalization term. We won't worry about this for now. Yeah? Seems like a reasonable behavior to program into the gazelle. So far, so good? OK. All right. So basically, at every time step, the gazelle is going to sense all the predators, react most strong, strongly to the nearer ones, and head in the other direction. OK. All right. <coughs> There's a lot on this slide. We'll go through it. We're going to now look at evolving behaviors for the lions. And if you look down to the bottom of the slide here, the title of the paper is Evolving Teamwork and Coordination with Genetic Programming. We talked about genetic programming. We talked about genetic programming back when, at the beginning of the course when we talked about evolutionary algorithms. There are thousands and thousands of different kinds of evolutionary algorithms. They tend to fall into different categories. There are genetic algorithms, uh, evolution strategies, and genetic programming. Anybody remember about what makes genetic programming unique? Strong hint at the top of the slide here. The genotypes 
in genetic programming are encoded in a particular data structure in a tree. You're working with basically an evolution, uh, you're working with the genetic algorithm, which encodes your sets of synaptic weights in a vector, right? The genome in your code base, the genomes are vectors. In genetic programming, the genomes are trees. And these trees are going to be translated, the genotypes are gonna be translated into phenotype, and the phenotypes here are going to be what the, the a swarm of lions, the pride of lions, are going to do, yeah? Okay, so in genetic programming, we have to tell, the, uh, we have to tell genetic programming this particular evolutionary algorithm, how it can put together various operators and operations to make a tree, and then how to evaluate that tree to create the phenotype. So we have a long list of the sorts of things that the evolutionary algorithm can use to build the tree. The first three elements here, you'll notice that the number of arguments for these building blocks are zero, which tells us that these are operations. They don't require, uh, these are operation, uh, operations, they don't require any arguments. The other elements here, you can see they have non-zero arguments. So these are oper uh, uh, operators. They're gonna operate on either other operators or, uh, sorry, not operations. These are the operands over here with zero arguments and we have our operators over here. So as we're gonna see in a moment, genetic programming is gonna randomly try and combine together operators and operands to form a tree and then use that tree to control how the lion moves, yeah? Okay, so let's do some cartoon examples. Let's create a, a tree at random. We're going to start by creating an empty node. This is the root node of the tree. We have this big bag of operands and operators. We shake it up, we reach into the bag, and we pull out one element from this bag at random, and let's say we happen to pull out the last operand here, number one here, which as the description of this operand says, this is going to return a vector that points in the direction the lion went last. Yeah? So we're gonna take our gazelle and our four lions, we're gonna drop these five agents at random positions onto this toroid. We're gonna compute what the gazelle is about to do at the next time step. And we're gonna use this to compute what each of the four lions do at the next time step. Since this, the, since this is the first time step of the simulation, this particular operand is gonna return a random normal vector. So a vector of length one pointing in some random 2D direction, which means the pride of lions is going to move randomly during the first time step and the gazelle is gonna move three units away from the four lions on the toroid. So far, so good? Okay, what do the four lions do at the next time step? They will not stay in the random direction. They're gonna go each in their own direction that they moved at the last time step. So we've got a whole bunch of lions that moved randomly and now start moving in a straight line forever. How is the gazelle going to fare against this pride of lions? Gazelle is probably going to do okay, and the lions are going to go hungry, right? We haven't talked about how to compute fitness yet, but you can imagine this particular genotype, which produced the lion pride phenotype we just described, probably going to be assigned a low fitness value. It's probably going to be deleted out of the population of other random trees and some other tree that got the lions a little bit closer to the gazelles are gonna produce randomly modified copies of themselves, yeah? So let's make another tree at random. This one contains the random direction. How does this pride, of, what does this pride of lions do? And how well do you think they do at bringing down the gazelle? They move in a random direction every time, like a different one every time? Yep. Maybe, yeah. We'll actually see some data in a little bit. Not a great strategy, as you can probably imagine. How about if all the lions always move in one unit distance towards the gazelle at every time step? What about the 
They're no, they'll never get there, right? The gazelle's like, fantastic, great. Chase me all you want. I'm moving at three times your, your speed. Yeah, okay, not great. Let's make another one. Let's imagine we're gonna create another random tree. We reach into the bag. In this case, we pull out the vector addition operation. Remember that in this experiment, we're always operating with vectors. Summing two vectors, not surprisingly, has, requires two arguments. So we have to create two empty nodes underneath the vector addition uh, opera opera uh, operator. We now gotta reach into the bag two more times at random. And in this case, we happen to pull out the random operand, which takes zero arguments. So we're good there. We still have an empty node over here. We visit this node, reach into the bag again. And in this case, we pull out the move towards the gazelle uh, operand. Yeah? So each of the four lions at every time step is going to evaluate this tree. Let's visit lion one. We plug in a random vector here. Minus 0.1 plus 0.8, and whatever the vector is that connects that lion to the gazelle, we sum these two vectors, and remember we get back a vector which dictates the new heading and magnitude of that, that lion's movement at the next time step. How does this particular pride of lions fare, do you think? Probably the best one so far because there's a decent but not great chance that some of the lions will um, go in front of, be biased towards the gazelle, but also in front of where it's going to go. Okay. So like that, that's going to happen half the time. If they do that enough, then they'll like corner it. The next one, like, like, Could be. They, they might not be able to corner it, but they might start to surround it just by random. M maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Have a look at the rest of the operators there. There's some that are a little less trivial. Here's an interesting one. This one requires four arguments, which means we need to put four empty nodes underneath. So we've got the if dot product in here. Remember, whatever else is created down here, let me start to put in some more parts. This is always going to return a vector. These are, all, uh, these are all vectors, these are all vector operations. So we're getting back a vector here. When we evaluate this subtree, we get back a vector as well. This particular operation dictates that we take the dot product of these two vectors. And if the dot product, if their dot product is greater than or equal to zero, we return the vector from this argument. If the dot product is negative, we return the vector from this argument. Yeah? Okay. I want you to try to imagine constructing a tree that gets the lions to capture the gazelle. You can use as many of these operators and operands as you like. We've just seen some that really don't work very well. Can you do better? You all know me well enough by now, right? Thinking about thinking is misleading. Not so easy. Not so easy to see how to put these vector operations together to design a capture strategy for the pride of lions. Good news for us, there's a use for evolutionary algorithms in this case. Yeah? Okay. So uh, I'm not gonna talk about the rest of the details of the evolutionary algorithm. We we'll just remember that at the beginning, we create a population of trees. Some are smaller, some are bigger than others. We take each tree, we drop it onto the pride of lions, observe how well the pride does, However well it does, uh, some of those uh, trees are deleted and replaced with randomly modified trees of the surviving trees. And if we repeat this process for tens or hundreds or thousands of generations, we can then look at the tree that has the highest fitness, 
play it back on the Pride of Lions and see how well they actually do, if at all, at capturing the gazelle. So far so good? Okay. In this, uh, in this study, as you're gonna see, they actually performed nine different variations on the experiment I just described. This is the first variant of nine variants. So we're gonna now go through these other eight flavors of this algorithm that they ran on the lion pride. The second experiment they did, everything was exactly the same as the first experiment, but they're going to throw four more operands into this bag. So basically four more building blocks that the evolutionary algorithm can use to try and uh, evolve successful strategies for the lion pride. These particular, uh, these particular operands basically give the lions a better ability to sense what's going on on the toroid. They're going to sense in a particular way, which is known as diictic sensing. Diictic sensing is relative sensing. So as I look out uh, at all of you, I can see that there are some students that are on my left and some students that are on my right. So if I were to start to describe some of you, I could say those on my left and those on my right, that, that way of referencing all of you is relative to my point of view, that's diectic sensing. Yeah? If I went through and said, Piper, uh, so-and-so, and I named you all, doesn't matter, obviously, where I stand, your name remains the same. That's name-based sensing, which we'll see in a moment. In this second variant, we're gonna see how well the lions do if, if uh, we evolve strategies for them such that they can perform diectic sensing. So what we're going to do, remember we always have four lions. So let's assume we build a tree and that tree was created randomly and we pulled out the nearest operand from the bag and that's it. So the nearest uh, operand is always gonna return a vector from the lion. Remember this is diectic sensing. So we have each of the four lions that are at different positions on the toroid. I'm, position, I'm lion I, and I compute the tree. Um, and so I get back a vector uh, from the lion nearest the gazelle to the gazelle. If I am the lion that's closest to the gazelle, I get back a vector that points from myself to the gazelle. If I'm far from the gazelle, but one of my pride mates over there happens to be closer to the gazelle, that's the vector that's returned. Yeah. Alternatively, I reach into the bag and pull out our lion here, which is a vector that I'm going to take my heading, the way I, the direction I moved previously, and I'm going to start to sweep clockwise. And the first lion that I see in this clockwise sweep this node is going to return a vector that connects me to that lion that is the first lion on my right. Yeah? Similarly for L lion, this vector will always return a vector for each lion in the pride that connects it to its first lion on the left. Why might diectic sensing in this way be helpful to the pride? be helpful for evolu the evolutionary algorithm to evolve successful strategies for the pride. Because they're chasing after something that's moving and they have to work with the other lines that are also moving? So there's an assumption here that coordination is useful, right? If coordination wasn't useful, I don't care what my right-hand lion and my left-hand lion is doing, I'm just gonna do my own thing. So if we evolve this variant and compare the strategies evolved here against the strategies from the first case, and these lions are doing better than these evolved lions, what does that tell me? That the, it's the second one you were talking about that did better, then that means coordination was useful? That coordination was useful, right? If these uh, uh, prides evolve to be more successful than these prides, presumably it's because they're using some of these 
which is as they're chasing the gazelle, they're paying attention to what their other pride mates are doing. So far, so good? Okay, variant three, we're gonna take the base set of operands and operators from the first variant and throw in name-based sensing. So in this case, there are now new operands that are available. For example, this tree, when we run this on each of the four lions, for each lion, it's going to return a vector from uh, the current lion to lion three. If I am lion three, what is this node? Good, what vector is this node going to return? Random. It's not random. Zero. Zero, right? I am lion three. Yeah. If I'm lion two, it's going to return a vector that connects me lion two to lion three. Now, what I do with that? vector might be combined with other op, uh, operations, might be combined with oper other operands using these other operations, who knows? Yeah. If prides evolved in variant three evolved to be more successful than prides in variant one, what does that tell us about this experiment, the situation here? If you ever played on a team sport, you're paying attention to the other members of your team. Sometimes you're paying attention dialectically, right? What are your teammates doing on your left-hand side? What they're doing on the right-hand side? Sometimes, depending on the sport, depending on your strategy, you're paying attention to player 47, right, on your team, regardless of what you're doing. Why is that sometimes useful? Why is that sometimes useful in a team sport? Why is that sometimes useful for lions operating in a pride? One of them should have the best position, so if you're paying attention to that one, then that's one you should work off of. Okay, perhaps member 47 is in a good position, but that might be temporary, right? They might be in a good position and then they're not, so now you need to pay attention to someone else. In this case, throughout the chase, during the duration of the entire chase, if these, if these are useful, the lions are always paying attention to lion three, for example. Why might that be useful? To always pay attention to one specific lion in the pride at all times. Could be the leader. The leader, right? So we're talking about teamwork now. Lots of different ways to work successfully as a team. Sometimes it makes sense uh, for members of the team to specialize. I'm gonna be the leader, or I'm gonna be offense. I'm gonna go after the gazelle. You all figure out what you need to do, but you all know that me, L that I, L3, I'm going after the gazelle, yeah? Choose your behavior uh, accordingly. So if lions in the third variant evolve to do better than lions in the first variant, that suggests that specialization has evolved and that it's useful under these conditions. So far, so good? Okay, let's keep going. I've shown you the first three variants. Let's pause for a moment before we look at the remaining six. Uh, I, actually, we are gonna talk about another detail of the evolutionary algorithm here. How do we take genotypes like this? There are, there's different ways we can take the genotype and use it to control the behavior of all four lions in the pride. The simplest thing we can do, and what we've been describing so far, is what's known as cloning. So imagine we have this particular tree here. We haven't plugged anything into the nodes here, but assume it's a three node tree. We take that tree and we drop four identical clones of that tree into the four lions and then let the lions loose. They're not all necessarily gonna do exactly the same thing, even though they have identical controllers. Why not? Genotypes are identical, but phenotype doesn't have to be. Individual phenotype for the lions, why not? They'll be at different positions relative to each other in the gazelle. They're at different positions relative to each other, to the gazelle, 
Things are different from the, from the sensory uh, point of view of the lions. Yeah? This is the simplest thing we can do. They also looked at uh, evolving their lions using free breeding. What does this mean? First thing it means is that now the genotypes of each of the four lions in the pride also can be different. Yeah? So in this case, they again were evolving trees, but they had one tree, and in that tree, underneath that, uh, the root of that tree were four subtrees, always four subtrees, where each subtree dictated the behavior of that lion. Yeah? So this entire tree here encodes the behavior for the entire pride. This second tree in the population also uh, embeds the behavior for the entire pride, third tree in the population, and so on. Yeah? Let's assume that uh, after the end of one generation, these three trees survived. Whatever behaviors these three trees uh, encoded, they were enough for these trees to survive and get to produce an offspring. They're actually going to get together and produce one offspring together. We're going to start creating this offspring by creating an empty node. And we need to create four subtrees. So we're going to create the first subtree by picking one of these three parents at random and then picking one of its subtrees at random. In this particular case, we chose the third tree at random and we chose the second subtree at random, and we take this subtree and copy it into the first position in the offspring. We copy it, and then we usually make a little mistake. We introduce a mutation here so that the behavior of L1 in this new pride is going to be slightly different than the behavior of L2 in this pride. We keep going. We need to fill in a behavior for L2, so we pick this pride at random, we choose this lion at random, copy it in, introduce a mutation, and keep going. And these three parents have collectively produced this one child, which is going to control the behavior of the four lions. So far, so good. What's the problem with this? There's a drawback with this approach. There's an advantage of this approach over this, which is? What's the advantage of free breeding over cloning? You can still have like a representation of the specialization of um, offspring. Yeah, that's fine. But um, your the whole point of specialization is that you have four roles that like work together, and if you're mutating in this way, then you're not going to get those four roles that work together. You're just going to get like four mismatched roles. Agreed. So the advantage of free breeding over cloning is that it allows for a little bit more specialization, or at least differentiation. The four lines can do different things. The four lines here can still do different things, but they're being generated from the same controller. So there's only so much specialization or differentiation that can occur in cloning. So in free breeding, we can imagine the four lions doing very different things. But if L1 starts to evolve uh, chasing behavior, it tends to be the one that goes after the gazelles. And L2, 3, and 4 are starting to evolve useful supporting strategies. That's all disrupted in the, in the offspring here because L2, which has been evolving a supporting role, is suddenly L1. It's the one that the others are assuming is chasing the gazelle, right? So there's, it's very difficult for specialization to start to evolve under these conditions. Everybody see that? How do we fix that problem? We bring in restrictive breeding here. Restrictive breeding, like free breeding, we're going to embed all four behaviors under one tree. We're also going to allow parents to team up to produce one offspring. But in restricted breeding, four parents have to get together to produce one offspring. The first lion from the first parent becomes the first lion. The second lion from the second parent becomes the second lion. Third lion from the third parent becomes the third lion in the offspring. And the fourth lion from the fourth parent, which I didn't have enough room to draw here, becomes the fourth lion in the offspring. 
Yeah? So now, over evolutionary time, specific behaviors for L1 can evolve and be retained for L1 down through the generations, and same for L2, L3, and L4. So far, so good? Okay, so let's review a little bit. We looked at three different variants where the building blocks of the lion's behavior is slightly different. We have the base set in variant one, we throw in dialectic sensing in variant two, in variant three, we go back to the base set and throw in name-based sensing. And we also now have three different ways during the evolutionary process that we can evolve strategies for the prides. We can take any one of these three breeding strategies and combine it with any one of these three sensing strategies which gives us a total of nine different experimental variants, yeah? which uh, you can see over here. So we've got restricted breeding in the, col uh, in the columns, or the, sorry, the three different breeding strategies in the columns, and the three different ways that the lions can sense their environment on the rows here. Nine different experimental variants. So far, so good? Okay, in this, uh, they then did 100 independent runs for each of these nine variants. What's, in it? What's an evolutionary run? You create a random population, evolve for 51 generations, look at what the best uh, pride does, go back, erase everything, start another random population, evolve again, see how well the best pride does, and repeat that a uh, hundred times. So at this point, they're doing 900 evolutionary trials. They did an additional 300 runs of three control experiments, which gives us a total of 1,200 total evolutionary runs. Let's talk about these three control experiments. What are control experiments? Control experiments, as the name implies, is a way to sort of control for or understand what sort of the basic abilities of these prides are. So in the first control experiment, they just started with one lion, and they evolved, uh, they evolved behavior for that lion using the base set, using the base set. And because we don't have a team, we just have an individual lion, none of these breeding strategies apply here. Just evolve trees for that single lion. That's the first control. They did 100 evolutionary trials of that. They evaluated 100 times one randomly moving lion and saw out of those 100 trials, how well did it do on average at bringing down the gazelle? Third and final control experiment, they looked at 100 different randomly moving prides of lions. How well on average did those do at bringing down the gazelle? Okay, so we've got a lot of data to sift through. 12 different experiments, 100 runs of each. Let's see how well we do. So far, so good? Do you know why they specifically did 51 generations instead of like 50? Why did they do 51? For, uh, because of historical precedent. Back in 92, the very first experiments were done with genetic programming, not with lions, with something else. And the investigator at that time used 51 generations. Basically one generation for the random trees, and then 50 generations, 50 additional generations with the evolved trees. Completely arbitrary decision, it kind of stuck. Yeah. So no good rational reason, just historical precedent. Okay, so we've got in each of these 1,200 experiments, they start with 500 random trees. Uh, as you start to reach into this bag and pull out operands and operators, if you pull out lots of operators, you can imagine this tree starting to get pretty big pretty quickly. So it's possible that you can, if you're creating a tree at random, if you get unlucky at the beginning, it can start to be a very, very large tree indeed. So they set some constraints, which again came from the very first genetic programming experiment. 
uh, which was allow a maximum size of 70. If you're reaching into this bag and pulling out operators and operands and you get to 69 uh, nodes, on the 70th pull from the bag, you're only allowed to pull out operands, things that have zero, things that have zero arguments underneath. So you stop making the tree any bigger. Yeah? The tree depth was also capped at 17. If you get to 17, when you're making the 17th deep node, you have to only choose random operands, not op random operands and operators. Yeah. Okay. As I already said, once we have our tree, uh, we place the, the gazelle and lions at random positions. Each of them is allowed to move 15 times. So each simulation here lasts for 15 time steps. Yeah. Okay. Fitness function, pretty straightforward. In this case, they're going to try and minimize fitness. So fitness wasn't a good name. Should probably call it error here. Uh, the best thing the lions can do is at the end of those 15 steps, uh, at least one of the lions is less than one unit of distance from the gazelle. That's considered a kill in this experiment. Yeah. Otherwise, we calculate fitness, we look at the position of the gazelle, we find the closest lion, take the Euclidean distance between those two agents and subtract one, and that's fitness. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Okay, ready to look at some data? Okay, here we go. Uh, again, 1996, no YouTube videos, I'm afraid. So you're gonna have to imagine what the lions do by looking at how well they evolved to bring down the gazelle. Let's, uh, let's look at the control results uh, first to sort of calibrate our expectations for what's possible. Here's our one evolved lion. Over those 100 trials with uh, evolving behaviors for one lion, at the end of each simulation, at the end of 15 time steps, the lion was 7.4 units away from the gazelle. How good is that? Good, bad? How bad? It's, it's bad, how bad is it? It's almost the maximum distance, right? I can't remember what the Euclidean distance would be here, but the gazelle is basically pointing at the lion and laughing, right? This is the worst you could possibly do. So evolving behavior for one lion, completely useless, right? It's no better, actually, than one random lion. Maybe a little bit better, but not, not really, right? OK, not surprisingly. Four random lions. They do better. Why do they do better? Just because there's four of them and they're more likely to have like a gazelle near one of them. Exactly, right? In order for four lions to get to get to do as bad as one random lion, they'd all have to basically be at the same location, and the gazelle would have to be in the opposite diagonal. Yeah, you know, the opposite corner. Okay, all right, so this, should, this number here is gonna kind of calibrate our expectation for what four lions can do. Let's start to look at the results from the nine experiments with the nine evolved prides. Not surprisingly, oh sorry, four lions do better than one lion, we just said that. Let's have a look at some of the data here and make some observations. Let's start by looking at the clones over here the right-hand column. This is the case where uh, all the lions have the same controller, but they can do separate things. Regardless of whether they were using dialectic sensing, name-based sensing, or neither, this is variant one here, how were the evolved uh, clones doing? How were the evolved prides doing compared to the random prides? better, yeah? So there's potential here. There's something that these four lions can do to get maybe not to the gazelle, but a lot closer to the gazelle, yeah? Okay, let's unpack these three numbers here. Um, we're gonna look at clones evolved using, uh, this is variant one down here. 
neither deictic nor name-based sensing. Here's name-based sensing, and here's deictic sensing. You'll notice that the clones actually did worse with name-based sensing than the clones did with deictic sensing. This is a little bit of a more subtle difference. Why do you think that's the case? Because the whole point of the special um, the specialization um, gets defeated by the clone. Absolutely, right? So in name-based sensing, name-based sensing is to try and set up the lions for the potential, at least, for specialization. But clones don't allow that. So it turns out that it's actually a worse thing to do, right? Everyone in the pride is responding to, for example, L3, including L3. Not great. OK. Let's have a look at restricted breeding over here. This is where the behaviors for individual lions in the pride can evolve to get better and better over time. And in this case, we see the opposite. Name-based sensing now is doing better than deictic and doing better than neither of those kind of ways of sensing. What does that tell us? In fact, it was the best out of all the nine variants. Restricted breeding with name-based sensing. What do you think is happening in these 100 evolved swarms here? They're evolving their specialized skills. They're evolving specialized skills, and what else is happening? So presumably there's one or more specialists evolving in these prides, but you need not just for one or more of the lions to specialize, you need the other lions to To do what? They need to also specialize to support the others, right? So everybody presumably has a role in these prides, yeah? OK, again, my apologies. No cool videos to show you. It would have been great to see what was happening, especially in these prides. But you can be sure of one thing that wasn't happening which is that the lions were not communicating with one another, right? There's no signaling here. There's no language. They just move. They're looking at each other. They're looking at each other. They know where L2 and L3 and where they, are, where they themselves are, uh, but they cannot say, I'm going to go to the gazelle's right, you head to the gazelle's left. You could ask the next question, which is, would signaling be useful in this coordination task? So what we've just seen in this experiment, what we've just seen in this experiment is actually the evolution of coordination. In lecture uh, 22, which we're going to start now, we're going to see another set of evolving swarms. But in this case, the swarms also have the ability to evolve the ability to, to communicate with one another. And in this experiment, we can ask and test the, the scientific hypothesis, does uh, signaling help in coordination? We kind of know the answer to that question is already yes. But we can watch it in action. Right? We are a communicating species. There are many signaling and communicating species out there. How did we and how did they first evolve the ability to signal? What were the evolutionary pressures that were acting on those populations in which signaling happened to be a useful strategy. Sound good? OK, here we go. OK, this is the first and only experiment we're going to see in which our agents uh, are male and female. Uh, to this point, there hasn't really been a distinction. As you're going to see in this experiment, these two particular investigators, and interestingly, we're actually going further back in time. This is a very old experiment at this point, but a classic experiment, both in robotics and also in biology for the following reason. It was an attempt to explore how communication tends to evolve in artificial organisms. 
So again, nine years before physics engines were invented, we're going back to a very, very sim simple simulation. In this case, we're gonna visit a grid world, which means the male and female agents occupy the uh, elements in this grid, and they, some of them can move from one element in the grid to the next. So movement is discrete in this experiment. Yeah. Okay, why male and female uh, agents? One thing that communication is useful for is uh, if you have two conspecifics, two members of the same species, that want to do something together, like produce an offspring, no individual is perfect or totempotent, meaning it can do everything. We all have our unique advantages and disadvantages. So it's useful to communicate and coordinate to try and get something done that's beyond the ability of any one organism, like, for example, in uh, sexually reproducing organisms, to produce offsprings, offspring. Yeah. So we're going to actually look at these artificial organ organisms that are going to evolve, that may evolve the ability to communicate in order to, uh, in order to produce offspring. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to work with this 40,000 square uh, grid. Like before, it's going to be a toroid. So we have a two, imagine we have a sheet of paper that's grid paper. We've got 200 by 200 uh, grid. We take that sheet of paper, turn it so that the two long edges touch, bend it so that the two short edges touch, and we now have an infinite grid world. We're going to place at random into, this, uh, into these 40,000 empty cells 800 females and 800 males. We're going to place them initially at random positions in the grid, and each is going to have its unique location. Only one agent occupying a cell at any given time. So if we place, uh, if we're trying to place an agent and there's already an agent in that cell, we pick another random cell and try and place it in there. Yeah. We are going to simulate the females so that they are deaf and immobile, so they cannot hear and they cannot move but they can sing, they can signal. The males uh, are blind, but they can hear. They cannot sing, but they can move. Seems like an arbitrary and strange set of constraints to place on these two different sets of agents. Why do you think the investigators made these design decisions? Seems kind of odd. Ideas? The kind of the maximum of the conspecific is their almost the exact opposite. They're they're complementary, right? So, so the males are better at some things than the females, and the females are better than the males at some other things, which is often true in nature. It'll also probably be true when we start to deploy large numbers of swarms of machines and autonomous cars. Some are better at some things than others. If they want to coordinate their action, a good thing to do, is, if you're a member of the swarm, is to advertise what you're good at and what you're not good at and find someone that has complementary abilities so that when you work together, your uh, limitations cancel out and your advantages and your skills synergize. Yeah. Uh, one of these investigators, Dyer here, was, is uh, uh, an ornithologist. So uh, as you'll see in a moment, these are going to start to look like birds. So this is also sort of a, a biological modeling exercise. Yeah. OK. OK. OK, let's have a look, first of all, uh, at the neural controllers of these agents. And I apologize for the quality of, the, the quality of these images. Uh, I'll talk you through this. This should look familiar. Each of these 1,600 agents, 800 males, 800 females, each one of them has its own neural network that dictates what it does. This is what the female neural controllers look like. This is what the male controllers look like. In both cases, we have input neurons 
We have one layer of hidden neurons and one layer of output neurons in both the male, uh, sorry, in both the female and male controllers. We have recurrent connections and self connections, which is helpful for memory if memory happens to be useful uh, in this task. What the inputs and the outputs do in the males and females is different. Yeah? Let's look at the females first. What is input to their input layer? What is input at every time step of the simulation is the position and orientation of the male that is closest to her in her visual range. So let's go back to the cartoon, for example. Um, in, let's take this female here. This is her visual, uh, this is her visual range. Remember, females can see, males cannot. In this female's visual range, there is one male. The male is diectically, from the point of view of the female, to her southeast. And the male's orientation, the male is facing southward. So the male is going to move south at the next time step. Yeah. We're going to take that information and binarize it and feed it into the input layer. So uh, a male can be north, northwest, west, southwest, south, southeast, uh, east, and northeast. So eight possible uh, directions from the female. We can take that, uh, those eight uh, and convert that into a binary matrix. And if she senses a male, that male can be facing north, west, south, or east four possibilities, we can convert that into two binary input neurons. Yeah? Three binary neurons for the, uh, where the male is relative to the female, and two binary neurons for which direction the male is pointed in. If we look at this female down here, there are two males that she can see. This male is closer to her, so it's relative location to her, and its heading is what is fed into the input layer of the female at that time step. What do you think is fed into the input layer of the neural controller for this female at this time step? We've got to feed in something. We're feeding in binary values to the input layer of the neural controller for the female. What do we plug into that binary vector? Zeros. All zeros, yeah? Okay, so that's, this is basically the eye of the female. This is how she sees. What about the output layer? The output layer is also gonna return binary values. So in this experiment, they pick activation functions for the output neurons that squash the value to either a zero or a one. Remember that we can choose different activation functions that squash floating point values in various ways or round them in various ways. The binary vector that appears at that female's neural controller at that point of time is her song. That's the sound that she is emitting, emitting out into her uh, vocal range, which is the same as her visual range. Any male that happens to be within the range of a female is going to hear that binary song. How does the male hear that song? We take that female song, we copy and paste it into the input layer of every male's neural controller for every male that happens to be in her vocal range. So far so good? Okay. So that's the males. They take as input the mating call of the closest female. I put mating call in quotes because it is not necessarily a mating call. It's just a binary vector that the female happens to output. If a male, for example, like this one out here, is outside of any female's vocal range, it hears nothing. It hears zero, 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 zero. Yeah? Okay. Let's have a look at the output layer of the male's neural uh, controller. Uh, in the output layer, there are four output neurons. 
Um, they're represented as integers here. Uh, I don't know why, maybe back in 91, this was a common thing. It doesn't really matter for our purposes. All that matters is that at a given time step for each male, we look at the values at their output layer and we see which of the four output neurons has the highest value. And whichever, whichever of the four output neurons has the highest value, it's gonna trigger one of the four possible motor primitives for the males, the simple things that they can do. If the first, motor neuro, if the first output neuron is larger than the other three, the male will stay still. If the second output neuron at a given point in time is highest, the male will move forward in the direction it's currently facing. Third output neuron is higher than the other three output neurons, it will turn 90 degrees to its left. If the fourth output neuron is higher at that time step than the other three output neurons, the male will turn 90 degrees to its right. Okay, so we have females that are immobile, that can see, and that can sing, and we have males that are mobile. They are blind, but they can hear. Okay. All right, so remember we've started this simulation by creating 40,000 empty cells, putting these 1,600 agents into some of these cells at random positions, and now we start running the simulation. You should notice at this point that there's already something missing from this experiment. There's a lot of things missing from this experiment that we have seen in pretty much every experiment in this course so far. What's missing? Fitness function. Where's the fitness function? I haven't told you about a fitness function yet. There is no fitness function in this experiment. What else is missing? or at least what's, what exists in this experiment, but in a very different form. Generations. No generations here. As we'll see in a moment, no generations. We usually have a population of neural controllers for our robots. We do have, we do have 1,600 random neural controllers at this point, but they're not sitting in like a, a Python dictionary. They're sitting inside of the 1,600 agents, which themselves are sitting inside of this toroid. Yeah? We have a distributed evolutionary algorithm, much more like actual evolution. Yeah? The evolutionary algorithm is living sort of inside this set of 1,600 agents. Okay, so we have 1,600 random controllers in 1,600 agents. In the first time step of simulation in this toroid, we visit each of the 1,600, uh, sorry, we visit each of the 800 females first and allow them to see and then sing. So we now have 800 songs being played in various places in the toroid. Then we visit each of the 800 males in turn and allow them to move and do their thing. At the end of that, uh, after that, we have now updated the behavior of all 16 agents and we scan across the grid to see if any male has moved into the same cell as a female. If they have, we consider that a successful mating. The male, a male has found a female and or possibly a female has sung to a male in order to attract it to her position. Yeah? Remember, there is a coordination task that these 16 agents are trying to perform, which is to find each other. Yeah? So in this case here, uh, a male and female have found each other. We take that male and that female we make a copy of each of their two controllers. We make a modified copy uh, of each. So we introduce a mutation to some of the synaptic weights in these two copied networks. We take these two new, this new son, this new male uh, offspring, and this uh, one daughter, this one female offspring, and we find some other male and some other female out there on the toroid, and we delete them, 
and we replace that deleted male with the son, and we replace that deleted female with the daughter. Seems like, kind of, again, a kind of an odd thing to do. What's happening here? You're basically like replacing what would be the role of a fitness function with like the role of like actual evolution. Absolutely, right? So these two, the, the deleted male and female, by definition, are in different cells. They have not managed to find a mate in this uh, generation, so they are sort of vulnerable to deletion by the offspring of parents that have found each other and successfully made it. I think we will pause there for today. You have a quiz due tonight, and we will continue this story on Thursday. Thanks very much.